The Nazca were a social group that developed along the southern coast. This territory is pretty arid because there's no water for most of the year. Their dwellings were along valleys, which are really small oases in the middle of the desert. Archaeologists named the ancient group of farmers and fishermen who once lived here the Nazca, after the local river valley. They used the surrounding desert plateaus as a canvas for drawing giant geoglyphs. The Nazca covered these plains with geoglyphs and turned this desert into a space which was inhabited, dynamic, social, and vibrant through time. To identify and categorize these geoglyphs, we take a stylistic approach. We compare them with ceramics and textiles. They find similar motifs, but not from the Nazca period. These geoglyphs date to the year 200 or 300 BCE, which means that they were made before the famous Nazca geoglyphs. The hillside geoglyphs were created earlier than the Nazca are thought to have existed. So who was making geoglyphs before the Nazca, and why? In the 1920s, Julio Cesar Tello, the first Peruvian archaeologist, found 429 mummies wrapped in extraordinary textiles in an ancient burial ground. In the Paracas Peninsula, so archaeologists called the ancient people the Paracas. The funerary bundles are stored in Lima in the National Museum of Archaeology, Anthropology, and History of Peru. The fabrics the mummies were wrapped in reveal the extraordinary skill and artistry of the Paracas. and the images and symbols provide insight into their worldview. There are shamans in trances, deities, and severed heads. One of the most iconic Paracas textiles has only recently arrived at the museum. Wow. In the 1930s, after Julio Tello's excavations in the Paracas Peninsula, there was a lot of looting and some pieces. This one among them were taken out of the country. It ended up in Sweden. This is the first time archaeologist Delia Aponte has been able to examine the 2,000-year-old mantle. I'm happy. I've always wanted to see this piece. I'm surprised by the use of color. For the Paracas, colors have meaning, and the way they organize them is important. It's part of their identity. There is a symbolism we haven't deciphered yet, but which is definitely there. The Paracas imbued their funerary textiles with meaning, and Delia is particularly interested in their symbolism. Here we have a toad associated with humidity and agriculture. A few plants are sprouting from its back. Here, there is a condor. Hummingbirds drinking from a flower. A bean in the form of a human. The imagery related to animals and edible plants throughout the seasons suggests that the Paracas textile is a symbolic representation of the agricultural cycle. I think this is a masterpiece, the pinnacle of 900 years of this society's development. 
many of the Paracas images strongly resemble the newly identified hillside geoglyphs found in the Nazca region. It suggests the desert figures were created by the Paracas. So what happened to the Paracas? Bioarchaeologist and forensic anthropologist Elsa Tamasto Cajigao looked to DNA for an answer and got a surprise. There is a DNA type which is specifically inherited from the mother and it's very easy to classify. In Native American populations, there are only four lineages, A, B, C, D. And when I did a test for research purposes, it turned out I matched the D lineage, most common among the Paracas. DNA analysis of human remains dating from 800 BCE to the year 800 helps explain what became of the Paracas. In the Palpa and Nazca area, it's very difficult to differentiate biologically between the Paracas and the Nazca. They are genetically very similar. Yes, we find cultural differences, which makes sense. As the centuries go by, people change in the way they behave. The research suggests that sometime before the year 100, the culture of the people living in the region shifted and the Paracas became the Nazca. And while the styles changed, the Nazca continued the Paracas line-making traditions. 